Recently, I made a video about these old Sony headphones from the 1980s, but today I've got some modern ones. Let's talk about it. Well, I'm sure you can tell some things have changed since the 1980s. This is the Sony MDR-Z7 Mark II. It's a very large dynamic driver headphone, closed back vented, with a $599 price. Let's get into these with build and comfort, then we'll talk about sound and frequency response after that. Build-wise, these are immaculate. Nice metal finish all the way around, extremely lightweight. The adjustment mechanism on the side is very smooth and satisfying, and you can see number markers on the insides. So you can line it up to your preferences. Say if you took these off your head and you wanted to remember what they were at, that's pretty easy to get it right back to the same marker point you were at before, or if you wanted to adjust it to the same thing on either side. Either way, I very much love this adjustment mechanism. The headband has not incredible, but pretty decent padding on top, and the ear pads themselves are excellent. Very soft, very thick. They provide a really good seal on my head and on the head of the measurement rig. You can see our venting all the way around, and then we have dual entry 3.5 millimeter. Now, you could use a standard dual entry 3.5 millimeter cable with this, but Sony is using one with screw on connectors right here. So these go in, they screw on to lock. And there you go. Unfortunately, when they're just sitting still, the cables do run into one another. The cable's okay. I've seen this similar sort of cable style from Sony before. It's nothing to write home about, but it's not bad either. It's just an average, okay headphone cable. I will say the feel of the connectors is really nice on both ends. And as far as the ergonomics go, the cable's probably the weakest part of the headphone's design, next to one other thing. And that is this little screw right here. I'm going to take this screw out real quick. That screw is necessary to remove the ear pads. It's kind of silly that there is a single screw holding the pads in. You're going to have to buy replacement pads direct from Sony. It is what it is. I mean, you might be able to salvage this ring and find a pad that's somewhat similar to go on here, but the sound isn't going to be the same. Now, with that pad off, we can take a look at the driver here, and it is an absolutely massive, roughly 70 millimeters across. That is a huge dynamic. That is much bigger than you see in, well, almost anything, with the example being some things like the Z1R, which this, in a way, is kind of like the little brother to. Either way, words really don't do justice to how massive this dynamic driver is. I've got something for you. This is a normal 40 millimeter driver you'd find in a closed pack. And here it is next to the Sony for comparison. That is a dynamic driver that is the size of a planar. Let's put this pad back on and let's get into sound. Now, as immaculate as the build is on these, as much as I love the comfort and I love the design, the sound isn't great. In fact, I would go so far as to say that both of these cheap Sonys sound better than their newer counterpart. This is the CD900ST with the Yaxi ST2 pads. And this is the Sony MDR7506 with the Yaxi ST1 Deluxe pads. You can buy these for like 50 bucks. You can get these pads for like 30 bucks. Same thing with the CD900ST. The MDR Z7 Mark II, well, it's very bassy. It's very, very bassy. The bass is pretty tight. It's not super sloppy, but it does get into the mid range a bit more than I think it should. This gives it a very warm presentation that is impactful, it is dynamic, but it's a bit bloated by comparison. The mid range there is then mostly overshadowed and the upper mid range doesn't sound very present at all. We have some kind of peakiness through the treble, but it also dips into darker areas. So all things considered, while a lot of this headphone does measure within the bounds of what the average listener would enjoy, the variance within that range dips and peaks enough that it kind of sounds tubish. Not tube as in a vacuum tube, like this thing I have on my arm. I mean tuby as in it sounds like you were listening. In a tube. Don't ask me why I have this in my living room. I see you typing down there. I said, don't ask me. I don't know about you, but I'm not really into that whole tubular sort of presentation. Things are 
kind of hollow in nature. Vocals are both nasally, but also a bit bright at times. You can EQ it. It does take a lot of work, but it is doable. And while the sound itself isn't overly offensive, it's not like uh, certain Bayers or anything like that, it's just not great at the price. I'm not gonna go out there and say this is the worst thing I've ever heard because it's not by any means. In fact, it's decent by a lot of metrics, but it's also not a headphone that I would ever go out of my way to recommend unless you specifically just needed it for the build and ergonomic features and didn't care too much about the sound outside of its punchy and deep bass. Now it's also worth noting, there's definitely worse things out there for bass heads and there's worse closebacks out there too. But what I don't understand is the backwards progress Sony seems to have made since their earlier headphones. I mean, the sound of the 7506 with these upgraded pads or the CD900 ST with these pads in this sort of chassis with this sort of build quality would be unquestionably amazing. It would absolutely dominate the industry at its price, but this really isn't a headphone you see recommended ever, is it? I've had this discussion a bunch of times with friends. It's that if Sony could nail down their treble, in their modern headphones, they could dominate the closed back space. They could dominate a lot of the headphone space if they just had linear treble. Or even, maybe not linear, but just less erratic treble, I think would be the term. That aside, these do actually have decent staging. It kind of comes with that hollow tubular effect. Imaging is lackluster. And truth be told, I don't mind wearing these for things like meetings or media consumption, but I wouldn't really use them for work that is frequency response sensitive. So things like working on editing videos or editing music. But for background lo-fi tunes while I'm doing some spreadsheets, this is just fine. It's not a headphone that I'll be keeping in my collection. Though I did think about modifying it, I opened up the back on these and they are uh, so damped on the back side of the driver that realistically they didn't measure any different open than they did closed. So with all that said, let's talk about frequency response. Now I've got a few types of measurements pulled up here. First is this frequency response graph. The grayed out area is the bounds of the average listener preference. Basically if the headphone fits within these bounds, most people are going to like it. When things go outside of those bounds, it's when things get a bit more problematic. Now I've also measured impedance. We'll get to that in just a minute. You can see that sub bass extension is very deep, very solid, but then we can see where it starts to get a bit boomy in the mid range. That low mid range just has too much bass bleeding into it. It is what it is. If the treble was a bit more in line, that would be more tolerable and it would just be a warm headphone. But in this case, it's just too much because of the other faults of the headphone. From 400 Hertz up to around two kilohertz, it's actually really good but then we start getting into a bit more of an erratic region of the treble, as I mentioned before. We see spikes around 3.2 and then dips at four, and then spikes at six and dips at six and a half, and so on, it just keeps going. And while a lot of this is within the bounds of the average listener preference, it's a bit erratic. The average listener isn't going to want treble that's going to go like this within the bounds. It's more like the average person will prefer something that is right along the middle of that. And then a certain percentage of people will like what's above, a certain percentage of people will like what's below, and that's what makes up the whole bounds. But something that's going to extend up and down is going to be by frequency not appealing to as many people. For some people, certain frequencies are going to be too dark, while other frequencies are going to be too too bright all at the same time, which is what gives this headphone a very, quote, dark bright sort of sound. Again, this isn't really as good as what you get out of the classic Sonys, the MDR7506 or the CD900ST with the Axi pads on them. And again, those are $50 headphones, at least on eBay, versus this, which is a $599 headphone. Now again, if that treble from two kilohertz up was fixed, or at least was just linear, this would be a really, really, really solid headphone, an easy to recommend headphone. Some things you can throw on a tube amp and it will help them. Tube amp has a high output impedance. And so I've started measuring the impedance curves of these headphones. And in this one, well, that unfortunately isn't necessarily the case. What we end up with is more deep sub bass, which is interesting. I mean, you do get more and more punch in the low end, specifically an increase around 40 Hertz which that is some pretty deep bass, but some of the other faults where we have impedance spikes on this headphone tend to line up with its faults in the frequency response. So when this is on a tube amp, yes, you will get more sub bass, which you might want, but you'll also get more of that spike around three kilohertz. 
and more of the dip right next to that. What you end up with on a high output impedance amp then is this headphone becoming very V-shaped and not in a way that I personally find pleasing. It just kind of takes what we have here and takes it even farther out of the bounds of the average listener preference. Sony MDR Z7 Mark II. Should you consider this headphone? Well, that's up to you. I've given you all the facts and you can choose what to do with them. Honestly, it's not a bad headphone in a lot of ways. Again, the comfort is excellent. The build feels very premium. It comes with a 3.5, 6.3, and a 4.4 millimeter cable that has these screw on connections. The pads are excellent. The sound, well, it's very bassy and from two kilohertz up, it's a bit of a mess. If you really like the rest of the features of this headphone and want to EQ it to your preferences in the treble, you could absolutely do so. And in that case, if you're a person who really likes to use EQ, then I wouldn't have any problems recommending this headphone given all the other things it does well in terms of building comfort. But if you're looking to spend this kind of money to get something that sounds great outside of the box, I would direct you elsewhere, even to some of Sony's older offerings. Speaking of, if you want to check out this video on the CD900 ST, I'll have a link in the video description. It's a pretty fun one. These are a lot more neutral leaning, not as bassy and fun, but if you want an old Sony that is pretty decent in the bass, check out the MDR7506 with the Yaxi ST Deluxe Pad version one. And that is going to wrap up this video, guys. So if you liked it, leave a like down below, a comment, let me know what you want to see in the future. If you want to get active in the community, you can have the forums or Discord, both available at the link in the video description. As always, don't forget to stick around and subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Until next one, guys. Peace.